This week on Georgia Traveler, we venture to 1,300 acre Callaway Gardens, a nature friendly resort in Pine Mountain with endless activities and a flying high circus. I'm amazed at what we're able to put together. It's so much fun. Give in to your sweet tooth at Cacao, where we explore the tasty art of chocolate making with Michelle and her friends. I'm here with my girlfriends for a private chocolate making class. Ride shotgun with a dirt track racing legend in Chickamauga and get a front row ticket to two of Georgia's fastest and most exciting tracks. A journey to Andersonville with Ricky and learn of the country's most notorious Civil War prison that's now a national historic site and museum. Then stroll through a unique century-year-old coastal farm near Savannah that boasts one of the world's largest varieties of bamboo. Georgia Traveler is coming right up. Bikes and beaches to zip lines and butterflies, Michelle and I journey to Pine Mountain's Callaway Gardens for family adventures and a flying high circus. In 1952, Case and M. Virginia Hand Callaway founded Callaway Gardens to promote their love of nature. Located in Pine Mountain, Georgia, this four season resort is the perfect getaway for families, couples, and individuals. 12,000 acres make up Callaway Gardens Resort where David and I found everything from pure relaxation to summer adventures. There are year-round activities in a picture-perfect setting, but what often keeps visitors coming back to Callaway is the land itself, an original vision from the Callaway family. Case and Callaway grew up in an upper-class family in LaGrange, Georgia, but his parents, Ida and Fuller Callaway, kept him grounded, building character as he became a man. He married Virginia in 1920, and together they envisioned this woodland paradise in West Georgia for the world to enjoy. Case and Virginia's son, Bo Callaway, helped develop the garden, creating the vision that still stands today. A major reason for the garden's creation was to save a particular species from extinction, the plum leaf azalea. They found a spring that was beautiful that people would gather around, but they also found this beautiful flower in the middle of the Georgia summer. And so Casey Callaway took a sample back to Virginia Callaway, who was a self-taught botanist, and she researched it and found it close to be in extinction. They ended up buying that 2,500 acre tract of land that had this flower and the spring. These plum leaf azaleas that have since become the emblem of Callaway can still be found in plentiful numbers throughout the gardens. But the gardens alone are just the beginning of a Callaway experience. Robin Lake Beach is the world's largest man-made white sand beach. And from May to September, it's the hub of summer activities. That's right, you'll find everything here from boating, swimming, tubing, volleyball, tennis, even laser tag. From laser tag to canopy tours, amenities like the treetop adventure are available to guests who are willing to take on the wilderness. You see, on this canopy tour, the guides give you a prep course but actually remain on the ground, allowing you to navigate your own high-flying excursion. Between the treetop adventures and beach activities, you can stay busy for a couple of days. But this is just a portion of what Callaway offers. Visitors say it's the magical atmosphere and family-friendly setting that keep them coming back. We started coming here 50 years ago. My family lived in Atlanta at the time. That's how we knew about Callaway. And we came back every year. And I now live in Denver. But we still come back because we just love it here. We love all the activities. It's so family-friendly. It's a really safe place to come. The Cecil B. Day Butterfly Center is one of the largest butterfly conservatories in North America. This tropical peaceful setting is home to over a thousand butterflies. When you stroll through this tropical paradise, you become a part of a magical intimate setting. From magical to majestic, I had a chance to catch the Birds of Prey show. Experts here tell you about these incredible hunters. 
And the action doesn't get much closer than this. We have a bicycle trail called the Discovery Bicycle Trail that's 10 miles and it connects all the attractions. We also have five walking trails. There are several places to bunk up for the night here at Callaway. There's the main lodge and spa and the Southern Pine Cottages and Mountain Creek Villas nestled comfortably in the woods. And come Christmas time, these beautiful gardens turn into a world of light and fantasy. As you explore the grounds of Callaway Gardens, you may come upon a sign that reads, Take nothing from these gardens except nourishment for the soul, consolation for the heart, and inspiration for the mind. The beauty of West Georgia is unveiled, a garden of paradise for all to enjoy. One big time, big top performance that has been dazzling crowds here every summer since 1961 is the one, the only, Florida State University's Flying High Circus. The applause, laughter, and occasional gasp are all part of this Callaway summer extravaganza. Here at the beautiful Callaway Garden. Every time I'm amazed at what we're able to put together and it's so much fun that I just can't help but enjoy it. Since 1947, Florida State University has offered a circus school, one of only two in the entire country. The top students in the circus school, like Ross and Nicole, are invited to a summer adventure each year to perform and to serve as camp counselors at Callaway. And we kind of just train throughout the school year and then they pick a select group of kids to come here and continue to train and then we do the 60 or so shows throughout the summer here. Well, working with students and your peers is really the best part of it just because you get so close to each other as part of the act or part of the show. Um, it really becomes something like a giant family, and it's great. From the flying trapeze to whatever this roller skating neck straining spinning act is, whew, these college students were at the top of their game for this summer performance. A Callaway tradition since the early 60s that has got to be one of the greatest shows on earth, or at least in Georgia. Let's join Michelle and her friends at Cacao Atlanta Chocolate Company and learn this handcrafted edible art that comes straight from the bean. Founder, owner, and chocolate maker, Kristen Hart is known for producing some extraordinary chocolate. We're visiting Cacao Atlanta Chocolate Company to get the secret behind making chocolate. The process of making chocolate from the cocoa bean uh, starts on the farm, so I spend a lot of time in other countries actually sourcing those beans, and once we import them and get them in our factory, then we roast them and we sort them. We grind those beans into um, a kind of liquid, and then we add sugar, and only sugar, and then we produce chocolate from there. As a child, Kristen had a love for cooking up things in the kitchen, but not until after traveling the world as a chef did she discover her passion would lead her to making chocolate. I'm one of the uh, very few female chocolate makers in the United States, and I was the first female chocolate maker uh, making chocolate from the cocoa bean to start a company in the United States as well. Not only is Kristen exceptional, so is her boutique. It's one of only a few bean-to-bar chocolate making companies. And with multiple locations, you can experience just about anything chocolate your heart desires. Uh, Bean-to-bar chocolate making means that you're actually sourcing the cocoa beans and you're making chocolate from those cocoa beans and by sourcing our own cocoa beans, we're able to choose the best of the world. After tasting Kristen's wonderful creations, I decided to invite a few friends to one of her chocolate making classes. And welcome to your first ever chocolate making class. Um, I'd like to begin, yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be fun, it's exciting. The one that you're gonna be working with today is our Dominican bean, it's called Hispaniola. Uh, the bean has those classic dark chocolate flavors to it. I've always loved chocolate. And it's hard to believe that the bitterness of this bean creates chocolate that tastes so good. And this is actually a superfood. Um, this is loaded with antioxidants, minerals, vitamins. You can eat these just like this as a snack. You can put them in your granola, um, mix them into a smoothie. They're extremely healthy for you. So I'll be passing out your piping bags full of chocolate. Feel free to get as creative as you'd like. Whatever you want to do. We can make anything. Absolutely anything. You can spell your name. I can pose if you want to do my profile. Yeah! <laughs> it's up to y'all. So. And ladies, nothing freaky, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we are a family show. <laughs> 
please refrain from sticking your mouth directly underneath that spot. <laughs> yeah. I know it's hard. I'm gonna be pulling the chocolate from our tempering machine so that um, it gets to where you can work with it. It's gonna be great for making your creations today. I can't wait, this looks so exciting. Yeah. Okay, so once you have your bag, um, you can go back over to the table at your station. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I wanna take what are you making, Sandy? I'm not sure yet. I want to see what becomes oh, of it. You got a heart, too. Yeah. 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 All right, ladies. Yeah. 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 Share it. I just want to pass out real quick our signature bourbon chocolate martinis that we have for you guys today. It's a mixture of our 75% dark chocolate sipping cocoa mixed okay. with bourbon, just for an added kick, but uh, it's paired really nicely together. We have to make a toast yeah, before toast. we yeah. try it, ladies. Yeah. Mm. Okay, friendship. Yeah, it's a friendship. And to chocolate. <laughs> After we tasted the delicious chocolate martinis, we were ready to see how our very own chocolate creations turned out. Um, I would just start from one edge and kind of like so, peel it off very slowly. The chocolate kind of express a different flavor. Exactly. So, you know, if you wanted to try it with something salty like the pretzel, you might get a little bit of the sweetness of the chocolate. Figure it out. Let's try this. I mean, it's really healthy for you. Like I was saying, it's just the cocoa nibs and raw cane sugar. All right, ladies, so now that we're done, I'm just going to give you some bags and we can transfer your creations uh, into the bags for you to take them home and enjoy later on. Or in the car. Oh, yeah! <laughs> 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 this is so many. <laughs> Cacao works with their guests to create special events, from birthday parties to a girls' night out. Thank you so much, girls, for coming. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting us. I know that I'll always remember this special day with my friends. Cacao truly does offer a one-of-a-kind chocolate experience. <laughs> Cheers! <laughs> Let's ride shotgun with a dirt track racing legend in Chickamauga, and sit front and center at two of Georgia's most exhilarating tracks. Here in Georgia, drivers and fans are addicted to the dirt. Mud flying in the air. Competition on the track. This Georgia red clay is a playing ground for speed. Dirt track racing is the most common form of auto racing in the country. Georgia alone home to eight professional tracks. Dixie Speedway in Woodstock, Georgia is home to the Dixie Shootout and Saturday Night Racing every week, February through October. And Rome Speedway in Northwest Georgia fills the stands every Sunday night during these same months. Its claim to fame, the fastest half mile track on dirt. Mickey Swims is the owner of both speedways. He and his family have run these dirt tracks for nearly half a century. We've been doing it so long, we, we feel like that we don't know anything else, you know? And, and we don't want to do anything else now. Years ago, Dixie was an asphalt track, less upkeep, but it didn't quite draw the fans. The crowd seems to like dirt better. When we had the asphalt track here, uh, we couldn't pay our bills. The car count triple, the fans triple. It's a brick clay, it's a, it's a special dirt. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. it comes from Rome. Marshall Green is a former dirt track world champion. Retired from racing since 2006, Marshall married into the Swims family and knows these two Georgia tracks as well as anyone. Well, Dixie and Rome is two of the premier racetracks in the southeast and really in, in dirt racing is the history of the sport. Dixie has a, a D-shaped tri-oval to where Rome's just a big round half mile. Rome's extremely fast. Like NASCAR, these late model dirt races are as loud as a thunderclap. Dale McDowell of Chickamauga is a perennial top 10 driver in the late model dirt track circuit who works with drivers on the track. I think everyone pretty much, if they start out here, you know, their ambitions is, uh, is really to go to the top, which is, you know, go to NASCAR. So, you know, a lot of dreams start, you know, right in this area and, and at these local racetracks. If you are a fan of dirt track racing and suddenly feel the urge to get behind the wheel, boy, have I got a treat for you. Inner Boyd Speedway up on the Georgia-Tennessee border, a smaller track, but one McDowell calls home. 
Dale, his brother Shane, and fellow late model racer Ray Cook run a driving school for everyone from beginners to professional NASCAR drivers aiming to get an edge on the competition. We all started the school and, and uh, you know, just as a, a, a service to, you know, some of the guys that would come through at that time just to try to speed up their learning curve. And, uh, and it has actually progressed and grown tremendously. So a lot of times we have young, really young guys, uh, like we're gonna have here today working with later, actually started out in uh, go-karts and then went to bandoleras and then went to legends. If you get to this point right here, let's say you release your brake right in here, pick you a center line. I wanna hold my brake to that point, let off my brake and roll to my throttle at that point. Though young at 14, Brett Holmes is already an experienced driver, and Dale says he has potential to become a great dirt track racer. It was the hardest thing to, to grasp when it comes to taking those turns without losing control. Well, that's why I took him out in the two-seater, is to actually take him so he knows where his limits are. Yeah. You know, because once you go past your limits and hit the wall, it spooks you. So especially when you're a young guy learning like that because you're like, it messes your straightaway speed up. You're analyzing problems, yeah. you're analyzing issues, you know, as far as what's causing that. And that's what I told him. So once they get that thought process, mm -hmm. then they're thinking. It's a spectator sport where excitement is at an optimum. Wrecks on race night are nearly guaranteed. Dirt track legends are here in Georgia. Places like Dixie Speedway in Woodstock and Rome Speedway in Northwest Georgia are your ticket to this high-speed, mudslinging spectacle. Still to come on Georgia Traveler, Andersonville. A look at its POW museum and its notorious Civil War era prison camp. This tiny creek was the only drinking water source for the prisoners here. And explore a forest of towering bamboo. The University of Georgia's Bamboo and Coastal Gardens in Savannah is a 50 acre exploratory garden flush with exotic flowers and scenic walkways. Georgia Traveler will be right back. Now off to the Andersonville National Historic Site where Ricky explores its POW museum and the grounds of this notorious Civil War prison camp. More than a half million American men and women have found themselves prisoners of war since the founding of our nation. The Andersonville National Historic Site is where the nation honors their courage. Hi. Hello, welcome to the National Prisoner of War Museum. Thank you. Here in the National Prisoner of War Museum, we explore the experience of American prisoners of war beginning with the American Revolution all the way to present conflict. Touring the galleries, you can learn about what it means to be a prisoner from their own words. I already began to pray. I really didn't know what they were going to do with me. I was afraid. I was scared. When I have about five or eight, you guys come over and put their guns pointed at me and try to stand me up. I thought, well, I guess I'm not dead after all. Um, so, I was a POW. Rare artifacts belonging to prisoners of war fill the museum, as do the voices of family members talking about their experiences waiting anxiously back home. And the families that were able to pick up the pieces are very, very blessed, because a lot of us were not able to do that. So why are all American prisoners of war honored at Andersonville? because this is the site of America's most notorious war prison. During the Civil War, the Confederacy held thousands of Union soldiers captive at what was then called Camp Sumter. A rare item we have on display in the museum are original clothing worn by a prisoner here during the Civil War at Camp Sumter, the military prison. And this is underwear, but it's representative of the fact that prisoners were not being provided their clothing by the Confederacy. They were scavenging what was left of their own uniforms or taking it from dead prisoners before they were buried. To explore the original stockade site of the Civil War prison, pick up a free audio guide and take a self-guided tour by car, foot, or bike. We're walking the historic approach to the north entrance gate of the Camp Sumter Military Prison, what was commonly referred to as the Andersonville Prison of the Civil War. What you see in front of you is a partial reconstruction of the stockade wall that surrounded the, the prison site. Tall pine trees cut from the surrounding forest and buried into the ground created a 15-foot wall enclosing 26 and a half acres of open field. 
Welcome to Andersonville. Prisoners were exposed to heat and sun in summer, cold and rain in winter, with no means of escape. This tiny creek was the only drinking water source for the prisoners here. It quickly became so unsanitary that diseases like dysentery and diphtheria quickly spread among the men. That's because what they called the sink was also their toilet. Prisoners died here at a rate of more than 30 a day. It might look like a wide open field now, but imagine 32,000 men trapped here under armed guard. Prisoners here coined a term commonly used today, deadline. But for them, it was the line 19 feet inside the pine log fence, where if they crossed, they would be immediately shot dead. This corner is a place where we replicate the appearance of the shelters that prisoners were improvising using whatever materials they had, including tents, blankets, ponchos, coats, and other items. Sometimes several to a tent, yes. right? Yes, you know, as many as 10 in some cases. There's something important missing, and that is, of course, the presence of 50, 60, 100 prisoners milling about in this corner, their smell, the, the, their activity, the ever-present watchfulness of the guards on the towers, and the sense of drudgery and challenge that faced every, every man as a prisoner of war here during the Civil War. Nearly 13,000 of those prisoners did escape the drudgery of this place through death. They are buried here at the Andersonville National Military Cemetery which continues to serve as a final resting place for American veterans. Whether you're touring the cemetery, the stockade, or the museum, the Andersonville National Historic Site tells the story of the struggle for life, no matter the circumstance. Now it's off to Savannah to admire a 100-year-old farm with one of the country's most impressive collections of bamboo. Bamboo is the largest member of the grass family and one of the fastest growing plants in the world. And believe it or not, there's an old farm in Savannah with one of the largest varieties of bamboo in the United States, the University of Georgia's Bamboo Farm and Coastal Gardens. They go about and see which bamboo we have. Green bamboo, we have yellow bamboo, we have orange bamboo, we have black bamboo, we have mottled bamboo, we just have all kinds of bamboo. There are over 100 varieties spread throughout 51 acres of land. However, bamboo isn't the only attraction. We have camellia gardens that uh, has over about a thousand varieties of camellias and trails that they can walk through, a gazebo they can sit in and just observe the camellias. A iris garden that has about 400 varieties of bearded iris, which is just almost unheard of in the southeast. We have roses, and we have just areas under trees that they can sit in, we have bananas. The gardens are open seven days a week, and there's currently no charge, so bring your dog, your picnic basket, and feel free to go explore the grounds or simply lounge. A lot of people do the walking tour because they want to do it at their own pace. You can visit and stay and sit down at a park bench along the way and look at nature, the butterflies, the birds, the bees. Before the Civil War, much of this coastal farmland was home to rice plantations. But by the early 1900s, the owners of this land began planting giant bamboo and it thrived. At one time, there were over 165 varieties. The bamboo was used through the years for experimental purposes by the USDA and by industrialists like Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone. The farm then became one of the first plant introduction stations for the USDA, but as budget constraints grew, they shut down their operations, and in 1979, the area was assigned to the University of Georgia's College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. And now the farm has a bright future. The university system, along with significant volunteers and monetary support from the organization Friends of Coastal Gardens, they have big time plans. Everybody's familiar with corn mazes around the country. This will be a first a bamboo maze of this consequence. And so we think that's going to be a major attraction for children and, and families. That's right, towering bamboo stalks rising higher than your average corn maze. And unlike corn, it won't disappear come wintertime. We think that a person can come here any time during the year and learn something about gardening, learn something about a natural habitat in this region of, of Georgia, and uh, be inspired enough to go back and turn it into something useful that they can put in their own yard or their own facility. 
The Bamboo Farm and Coastal Gardens, a hidden gem located near the south end of Savannah. Stop by on your way to the coast or take your time and make a day of this one-of-a-kind garden variety. That's all for now. Until next time, pleasant journeys. Please. No. I quit. I quit. Matt. They were in my nose as he was talking. Yeah. I'm, I've been eating them, been snorting them, and you know, at a certain point, you yeah. just... Air normal. No alfalfas moving. Wait, you gotta face the camera, don't you? Stop it, David. Oh, I didn't know you were behind me. <laughs> oh, no. I don't want to go fast. <laughs> Known for producing some extraordinary chocolates, we're visiting... I'm sorry. Let's wait till the barbecue. Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.